So just this one verse to focus on this morning. Revelation 14, verse 13, the word of the Lord. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. The word of the Lord. So, as we mentioned, and you may have taken notice of, Christmas is over. And there can either be amens or, oh, that's so sad. So it depends on your age and your perspective. Um, but now we can maybe uh, rest, but Christmas is not really over, and we know this for the Christian. You have to be careful not to pack Jesus away as you're packing up your decorations and taking down your tree as if now Christianity is being placed back in boxes where it belongs and will be brought out again next year to be celebrated you know, once again. So we do make... We do make a bit too much of this Christmas season. However, it is a good thing um, for a lot of reasons that we do, not the least of which it does tend to make us a little more outwardly focused, a little more focused on joy, a little more focused on the birth and resurrection, hopefully of, that we think of these things of Jesus Christ, why he came into the world, that he came into the world. Um, and then also that as children um, see the attention and the details that are put into it, and as we uh, are able to say, look at these symbols, this is what it really represents. And as you go, and it's like even street lights, you know, flash a bright red and green, you know, but there's a yellow in there. Caution, you know, be careful that you don't just think this is all about this um, in, in increasingly secular holiday so be very careful um, with that but I think it's good to celebrate Christmas I think it's probably bad to be one of those people who say I hate Christmas stop it stop it stop it stop it you can find something to be upset about you can always find something to be upset about um, this is a good time to find something to be happy about. It's a good time to find something to be joyous about. It's a good time to, you know, you can either look back at the way things were and weep and cry. Or you can be like Paul and forgetting what lies behind. I look forward to the upper call of Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about a little bit of different things, but he was talking about, I used to find my meaning and significance in these old things. But I found out those things aren't where ultimate meaning and significance comes from. I'm going to focus on the things that have ultimate meaning and significance. That doesn't mean you forget your children because they have lots of meaning and significance. God wants us to raise our children in the fear of the Lord, in the right fear of the Lord. He would love for our children to grow up in homes that are happy and bright and joyous and nobody's ever fussing or fighting and they raise them up. But God gave his own son human parents. And with that comes problems. So the best thing a family can do is acknowledge, I tell you what, we really mess this up sometimes. You know, you get angry, you get upset like Chris does with the angel. Gosh, Chris, I'm sorry, that comes to my mind every time. It's just that Chris is one of the, one of the least, he's one of the most, what's the word I want to He's one of the most humble, kind of quiet people I know. And just to see him upset that his angel wouldn't light up one time just, conjures all these images up but anytime you mess up I mean I was I was a serial killer a serial killer at one time in my life because I got very angry at my son one time and he had a box of cereal that he was eating and I got so mad I just threw it down and just crunched it into the ground and he looked at me like what's your problem I said your father's a serial killer leave me alone and I walked away and uh, but you ask forgiveness to your from your children too you know sometimes we mess up and it's good for the world for your children for your people around to know we're normal there was a family that lived next door to our house in a, another church I pastored and they weren't Christians um, but they would visit the church, and I was talking to them about the gospel and stuff. But this family was the best family. I was like, man, it was aggravating me that the family that wasn't the Christian family seemed to have it all together. And I was like, mm, we ought to be. <laughs> so I went over there one time, and um, he was just stomping and cussing and going on. And, and I opened the, they looked, and there I was. And he was like, <gasps> I said, 
I'm just happy to see you guys are like the rest of us. <laughs> And so we have to give ourselves a little bit of a break with these things. But, you know, it's, nostalgia is good. Memories are good. But one, if you cling to, I guess one way you can tell if you're clinging too closely to the past, if you aren't enjoying who and where you are and looking forward to things and what can we do and what does God have me now is if Christmas and nostalgia and things like that like really hurts and it causes you lots of sorrow, and you can't quite dig yourself out of that, then we need to focus more on Christ. We are focusing too much. Um, sadness, things like that are, 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 are good and they're normal, but we have to make sure that when you see you know, the, the, the joy that's Christmas and you see the sadness of life, it, it's like the whole way we've done Christmas is a bit of a sham. Okay, I mean, it's supposed to always be, you know, bright and shiny and stuff. And it's just like, you know, so that's why I think a lot of people leave their Christmas lights up so long. They don't want to let it go yet. You know, and, I, and my rule is like, wait till, the end, wait till the new year to start taking things down. Amy's rule is, she's not working so much now, but she's like, I got to go back to work. Who's going to do this? Are you going to do this? We need to start taking this down now. I'm like, fair enough. <laughs> so let's get to work. But. You do have to be careful because all of a sudden the, the the ornamentation goes away. And so, but if you're grounded in the depth, then you are blessed. And that's what this message is about. Because Christmas, the first Christmas was about the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, himself, peace on earth, entering into the world in a new way as a human being. For the specific purpose to save us all from Satan's power. To save us from the wrath and curse of God due for our sins. And only God can save us from God. So that's what he does. He saves us from himself, for himself, by himself. Only God would be able to do this. And in here in Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead. Now, you could end it there. I thought about naming the sermon that today, but I thought, I don't know. That doesn't really sound so good. It's like a good Halloween sermon or something. Blessed are the dead. But it's blessed are the dead in the Lord. And so to be in the Lord means you're of faith. And it's a, a phrase. It's a technical phrase in the Bible. It means that you're, you're hidden in Christ. You're represented by him. You are dealt with by God the Father, hidden in Jesus Christ. So... It's as if, you know, God sees all your sin. God um, knows much more intently your messed up parts of your life than you do. And thank him for that, because if you realize how messed up you were, you we wouldn't, I, I couldn't get out of bed, I'm sure. So he helps us to see what we need to see when we need to see it so that we are not only dealt with as hidden in Christ, but we are gently over time being conformed to be more like him. And that's what Christ is doing. But to be hidden in him is, is important because without being hidden in him, then you're just under the wrath and curse of God. So that means people who aren't believers are not hidden in Christ. Why aren't they treated a whole lot worse than the rest of us? Well, in one sense, they are. If you, you know, one of the things I think is telling in a Christian's life is you'll see somebody who's lived their whole life as a Christian, um, and then somebody dies that was notorious, but on their deathbed they make a confession of Christ. And if your thinking is, well, that's not fair, they got to live their life the way they wanted to their whole life, and then they get to go to heaven in the last minute, that's not right. So what you're saying is, I would rather live a life without Jesus Christ and then last second come to know him and go to heaven. That means you're all messed up and you don't have a clue what Christianity is. You need to repent and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Don't just do the trappings. Don't just decorate your tree. You have to have fruit that comes out of you. You know that tree's not alive, right? <laughs> but my trees at home, they're alive, aren't shining like that. With I don't know. Some of y'all put lights in your trees and stuff. But that doesn't make it alive. Okay? It's external trappings don't make the tree alive. We are alive in Christ. And so... God, who makes the, the sun shine on the righteous and the wicked, who makes the rain to fall on the righteous and the wicked, the difference is the righteous are supposed to be acknowledging him with grateful 
acknowledgement. <laughs> we are thankful for what we have and that we're able to use these blessings not just um, as act of altruism, as just trying to help other people, but because, God, you gave this to me, I have, a, I have responsibility for it, and you've given me great blessing, and I can be a blessing to other people. How, how might I be a conduit of these blessings that you're giving me? And then when the rain falls, when the difficult times come, and when, when these difficult things happen in our lives, that's when this idea of blessedness needs to be something that we have. Uh, I know when I was a child, um, the worst thing, and, and, and if you're in this younger generation, you guys can be thankful for our generation and maybe the generation behind me because we tried desperately to solve one problem on Christmas morning, and that was you, know, you don't have batteries for your things. I mean, typically, by this time, we've all figured out, make sure you have batteries. And a lot of your things come with batteries. But there's nothing worse than getting a toy on Christmas morning and there's no batteries. And back in the day, man, all these things make me feel so old. There wasn't a Walmart. Everything closed down Sunday. You weren't going anywhere to find batteries. You might go around the neighborhood and find somebody that maybe had batteries, but that toy was dead. You had to do something with it. But I don't know, I'm talking about my trauma up here, y'all. Y'all got to give me a minute. <laughs> you know, so... And then that can just destroy your Christmas. Or you didn't get something, which is what I love about an early February birthday. If you don't get it for Christmas, you can say, eh, you got time to make up for that here. So, but if your life is, is Christians, when hard things happen, if it just destroys you, it means you're worshiping these things. And we can't do that. It is sad when your battery doesn't work. You know, it's sad when something that you look forward to, especially if you're the one that gave it to somebody and you don't have the thing, you know, it's, it's, it can be disheartening. But this is where this idea of blessedness needs to come from because there's something that carries you through things that are much more difficult than just not having batteries for your present in the morning. And so... It begins here, and this is the second blessing, the beatitude, in the book of Revelation. So lots of times we think of the book of Revelation, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, dragons and monsters and bad things happening and stuff. But there's these cycles of sevens that are all throughout the book of Revelation, and the more you look, the more you see that they're in there. But one of them is there are seven benedictions, seven, um, sorry, seven beatitudes, blessed are. This is the second one. And so the question is really you know and let's look at this one first blessed are the dead in the lord from now on blessed indeed says the spirit that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them now in the king james it doesn't say it just says um, um blessed are those who die in the lord from now on yes says the Spirit, which is what the Greek says. I just thought I'd point that out. I don't know why they go, blessed indeed. It's actually, it says, yes. I like that better. The Greek, it's like, and it's nigh in, in Greek. Yes, says the Spirit in agreement that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. So that's why I started talking about rest to start with, because we come out of a busy season, you know, and it's busier for some people than other, others. But we live in a world of busyness, and not simply busyness, I have to go from here to there, but a laborious world that we can live in over time. So in this world, you labor. Now that word, there's two different words here, one for labor and one for deeds or works. And this word labor, I looked it up, kapon is the word, and it means it's, um, intense labor united with trouble and toil. <laughs> so I mean, it's, it's labor, that's a good word for it, it's laborious, something's just intense labor united with trouble and toil. And so if we read that, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, says it's the spirit that they may rest from their intense labor united with trouble and toil. I mean, that's good news. And it also means you, it's okay that you experience intense labor united with trouble and toil. It's the human experience. But what God wants to say and what the spirit says is, don't think that that's the definition of who and what you are, that there will be 
rest from this. Now, the next word for works or deeds is erga, where we get the word ergonomics, which is, means the study in the workplace. They figured out how to make people work better and harder by making them more comfortable sometimes. So if you have an ergonomically designed chair, it means they've designed this in the workplace so that you can work harder because you're more comfortable. You know, so don't let them fool you by giving you an ergonomic chair. They're just trying to make you more productive. However, I appreciate a good chair. So the, the, we will rest from our deeds. Oh, let me, let me ask, don't want to read it wrong. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. Okay, your, your works follow you. So there's a difference between these two things. One is that stuff from the curse, the hard, laborious work and toil. There's going to be rest from that. But your deeds, your works, are going to follow you. Now, it's very good that they don't precede you. Because if almost sort of makes it like, okay, this is why you're getting into heaven. It's like, no, 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 no. What has preceded us into heaven is Jesus Christ. He's there. He's already there. His works have paid for it all. His, that's what it means to be hidden in Christ. What he did when he was born, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He was resurrected. He ascended into heaven. In him, we did all these things, and we are seated with him now in the heavenly places. And that's what the good news is, his works. Now, though, our works, because this is what Revelation is. It is meant to be an encouragement to the church. Now, the problem with preaching Revelation is, in particularly our culture is you first have to get Americans to recognize the fact that it's not first the gospel is not about riches and wealth and prosperity and, and complete happiness all the time and you also have to get the church to recognize that just because we have a lot of stuff doesn't mean that's the blessing of God it can be a soft curse on people I mean you know you know, win the lottery and look what happens. And most of you go, I'd like to find that out. It's like, really? <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't know. And Paul prays that, you know, help me not to be so poor that I, I forget you and I steal. Help me not to be so wealthy that I think it all is on me and I don't have to pray for you anymore. You know, help me to know that I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. So we have to be very careful of these things. But the fact, the encouraging fact is that we as believers, there are things that we do based on our faith sometimes, that we pray for somebody else, we give something to somebody, we encourage somebody, we want to yell at somebody and we don't. You know, there's all these things that we try to do as believers. And what Jesus says on a few occasions, a couple of occasions, I mean, there's two things. One, you know, don't be bragging about that. Like, that's going to get you into heaven. Like, you're, you're all that. You know, you're only doing this in Christ, and our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. However, there will be reward for these. Nothing's wasted. There's nothing that you're going to be able to say, look at all I did, and it's not rewarded a thousand times. And Jesus even says, both in this life and in the world to come. So then it means, well, what is my reward in this life? And it simply has to be... Um, more of his presence, more of his, more faith, these things. If it's, you know, if you go to Jesus for money, then Jesus is not your God, money is, or whatever it may be. So you have to be careful of these things because to be blessed in the Lord might not look like you think it does. So we're going to look at what does it mean to be blessed so that these, it is a blessing that when we go to heaven, that these things we've done in his name show up there, cleansed, purified, and you get to see what Jesus and the Spirit and the Father did with the attempts to wash our Father's car with filthy rags and how he comes out and says, tell you what, that's a good job right there, buddy. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't such a good job, but he accomplishes more things. Or to be able to hand the wrong tool, or have rusty tools, and what God does with these instruments, these things that we give to him, these things that we do in his name that in and of themselves are not worthy of real praise. But what God does with them, and he shows us in heaven, it'll be quite amazing. 
And so if you want to look at that, just a glimpse, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's just look real briefly there. So if you find all of these before you, if you go backwards, it's, it's before you get to Hebrew in, Hebrews in the Bible. So we're 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. We read, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. This means not to be prideful, not to you know, elevate yourself above everybody else. Nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And so we see this in other places of the Bible. This is one of the places where you're being admonished, do good. <laughs> you know, admonish other people to do good. It's not just rich people, he says, do good. Poor people, everybody's supposed to do good. And what you're doing is you're treasuring up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, if you use the analogy in that way, it's like your works are preceding you. And you got a treasure of all this merit, okay? It's not a treasure of merit, it's just treasure of things that God is providing up there and doing for us because cause of the things that we do here in him and through him. It's a really strange thing to try to get straight in your head what it rewards in heaven means. Because as the believer, we understand it's like, all right, all my deeds are like filthy rags. So, eh, careful with that. Because there are good things that a person can do that are good things. I mean, a believer might you know, fix somebody's car for them and say, hey, no charge. Well, you did a good deed. It was a works. A non-believer could do the same thing. Is it a good deed? Yeah, it's a good deed, especially if he does it for you. You know, it's like, that's awesome. But is that going to go forward into heaven for him? And unfortunately, no. What it does is it'll just be used in his condemnation because it's like, let's really look at the motivation of why he did it. And so the the goats and the sheep that we see, I think is in Matthew, where it's like, you know, you, you did these things, you know, you, um, you gave something, somebody something, you gave, in my name, you, you gave something to drink. And they're like, when did we ever do that, that kind of thing? He says, whenever you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. But then the non-believers, he's like, whenever, whenever you didn't do it. And they're like, when did we not do it? And it's like, yeah, yeah this, this is the terrible attitude that you have. So for the believer... You can do good things, and we should strive to do good things. But if we do it in our own power only, if we do it for our own glory only, if we do it for the good of the other person only, if we're not doing it out of faith, if we're not doing it because, you know, somehow we're trying to live out a Christian life, and what we'll do is we'll say, you know, I did this good thing, but I know it's tainted with sin. And you know if you taint something that's nasty, you put something nasty in your drink, you don't want to drink it. I don't care how little bit it is if you know what's in there. You know, so we'll look at it like that. But as the believer, the way we should look at it is, you did this thing. It's like, uh, all right. <laughs> but you know you had a little bit of faith in there. You know, you, you, you did this because you, you remembered the Bible verse. That said, you know, I mean, there's a there's a different way of looking at it. You can't, and I think we stress it a little too much sometimes. Don't look at your works as getting you into heaven. Don't look at your works as making God love you more. You you look at your works as the way as if you're born again, your spirit is changing your life, you read the Bible, there's just desires that change and you want to be different. And if you do something out of a desire to serve God, a desire to do good, that's proper motivation. And so what God does is he graciously rewards our works. And that means they don't necessarily deserve it, but they are rewarded in heaven. And so these things, the way Revelation looks at it, they follow us. And it's a, and it's a good thing. But what do we mean truly by this word blessed? Makarios. There you go. We've used lots of Greek words today. Makarios. That's what it means. That's the word for blessed. And if you look it up, the definition for blessed 
there's all kinds of words, there's all kinds of meanings for it, but the, if you go more theological, dictionary type things, they use the word favored. So we, we think of Mary, Virgin Mary, favored above all women. You know, it's blessed, and it means highly favored. It can mean happy, but happy today is a little, you know, you, anything can make you happy. It doesn't necessarily mean you're blessed, but it kind of means that too, or fortunate. And none of that quite captures it. That word favored kind of gets in there. But I really think the word blessed kind of conveys the, the meaning of what it is. I think we sort of have a cultural instinct as to what it means. Because, you know, to be fortunate can mean something or to be uh, favored can mean something. But to be blessed, I mean, if you know, I mean, one of the ways that cashiers try to, I guess they try to do some kind of evangelism or something. But they'll say, you know, uh, Thank you, have a blessed day. And I'm like, that's eh, cool. So I, I try to remember, I try to throw that, that ironic benediction back at him. May the Lord bless and keep you. You know, try, if you want to say, may Yahweh bless and keep you. And really, you know, cause problems in the checkout line or something. But just the, you know, it's this inclination. Have a blessed day. What does it mean, have a blessed day? And then the, or somebody sneezes. You remember back in the day, you weren't scared to death when somebody sneezed around you. You say, bless you. Um, what's that mean? You know, Kazunheit. God bless you in German. It's bless you. Um, and then we do have the ironic benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. It, it just to be favored. And so in the Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes, the, the blessed are the poor, blessed are um, the, you know, the, the, what are they? <laughs> blessed are the poor, blessed are the, the meek and these things. Um, why does he say they're blessed? And what he says is because you shall see God. Uh, the kingdom of the God of God shall be yours. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You shall be filled. It's future tense. You're blessed. It's okay that you're like this now. Future, you have a great blessing coming. Because you're going to see God. You're going to be in heaven. Get through it. You got this coming. It's like the, the, the instinct of children as they're looking forward to Christmas. And it can't get here quick enough. And it takes four ever to get here and then we get old and commergently and we just nasty and we can't help it the older we get and you get all crazy it's like it it's like that and it's gone and it's like okay but even if you're happy and you're older and you're excited about it and everything it still goes like that it's like everything goes faster when you're older but children have the instinct such is the kingdom of God. We should be so looking forward to worship, so looking forward to communion, so looking forward to what it points towards to heaven, to his rewards, his blessedness that's to come that is taking forever to get here. And Revelation ends, oh, Lord, come quickly. Hurry up and get here. That should be our instinct. And he blesses us here and he blesses us but the blessing, the blessedness for the Christian is, it's like you're, you have this disease that's killing you, but you've now received the cure. It's just going to take a while for it to kick in, but it's coming. You're going to be okay. That's blessing. I can get through. It's, oh, maybe it's a little bit like chemo. Maybe if it's going to make you better, you know it's going to cure you. It's like, it's hard stuff. You only go through that because you're trying to get to wellness. And so that's the way we have to look at this life. It's not just something, I hate to look at this life as just like chemotherapy, but in a way, the things that are hard and difficult, they're just steps on the way to something that's going to so far outshine what you're going through that it's not even worth being compared. And that's what the Bible says. It's just, you don't know what's in that package. But I know it's a package, and I know what I've asked for, but you're God in heaven, your Father in heaven is so good that he's not going to give you what you asked for. He's going to give you what you would have asked for if you would have known what better you could ask for. C.S. Lewis talks about you don't know, uh, some children can't understand what a holiday at the sea means because they've never seen the sea. They, they've been happy eating mud cakes because they've never actually had the real thing. And so we, you know, will this be in heaven? Will that be in heaven? And the answer typically is no. But what that represents, what you're going to see so much better, is so much better than that that it can't even be put into words. It's not entered into the mind of man the things that await us. So we come up with, all, what's heaven going to be like? What's heaven going to be like? No clue. But it's going to be a little bit like Christmas morning to little children. Ripping open the packages. 
but without the tears, the batteries are going to work. It's going to be better than what they thought. It's going to be better than everything that they could possibly imagine. If you got a present that put it as an adult that was surprising and put a smile on your face and maybe brought tears to your eyes just for that moment, you had a taste of heaven. And that's the things that God puts in this earth for believers to see and say, thank God. And for non-believers to just like, what are you doing? You're heaping condemnation on your head for day of judgment. And that's why we preach the gospel. Because the stuff to come far outweighs anything that we might possibly deal with today. But I want to do in the last less than 10 minutes. Let's look at uh, the seven Beatitudes and just read them. And... Um, Revelation, these blessings. First one is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, at the very beginning of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1, 3. So one of the ways you get rid of hiccups is to scare somebody, but I'm not going to do that. You don't have to take care of that your own way. Uh, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. I always felt a little guilty reading that one, but, you know, you can read it aloud, too. You can read it yourself. This typically was read uh, in front of a church. Everybody didn't have their own copies of God's Word in their hands back when this was written. So it's a blessing to read it. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So this is the blessing, just reading and receiving it and keeping the words of it. And a lot of it is just talking about how you live your life in the world, maintaining victorious Christian living, which just means maintaining your faith through difficulties, shining like light, and letting people know who your Savior is. And the next one, you don't get to until chapter 14, where we are now. It's the second one, chapter 14, 13. <clears throat> I heard a voice from heaven. So kind of get, you know, it's a, it's a vision here. It's a voice from heaven. Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. That's awesome news. You know, dying in the Lord. There, there are um, some who had died from persecution. They're, you know, we've gone a long time. Now, those who die in the Lord, and it's not just then, but from now on to the end of time, they're blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, because they're resting from their labors, that, that laborious toil, that stuff. When we say, it always kind of bothers me a little bit when I see the rest in peace. Thing because, and I, I think it's right to say that, but it also, I think, can give people the impression that all you're going to do in heaven is lay around on a cloud and play a harp and nothing to do. You're just resting. And if you've ever, I don't know if any of you guys get to rest for long periods of time, but eventually it's like, I got to get up and do something. You can't rest. I mean, look at Ryan. Goodness gracious, man. <laughs> you know, it's hard to rest. You got to get up and do something, do something, do something. Well, in heaven, you rest from the toil aspect of it, but there's going to be so much to do that you just you spend eternity constantly newness and exploring more of the depth of blessedness and who God is. I mean, just imagine you have an infinite God. It'll take forever to find out things about him. There's no end to that. And so... You're blessed, and then your deeds follow you. So there's nothing that you do here that's going to be forgotten. It'll be rewarded as believers, and so we have that to look forward to. And I think as believers, sometimes we, we anticipate death and final judgment, and we're a little more scared of it because we think of the widescreen TV that's going to play all the evil things we've ever done, everything we've ever said, and hopefully you'll be ashamed of it. But, you know, we're all being in the same boat at that particular point, but forgiven in Christ. That's what we look forward to, hidden in Christ. You're blessed. God wants us to recognize the blessedness to come. And then in 1615, the third one. <clears throat> Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. All right, well, that. It's interesting sounding, but you kind of know what, he, what he's talking about. Yeah, you're, covered, you're hidden in Christ. In the garden, you were covered with the skin of the animals, with the, with the animal skin that was killed in the place of Adam and Eve, blood shed instead of theirs. They were to die that day, and their death did enter in the curse, but that day there was a substitution made, and they were covered. So blessed is the one who stays awake. That means maintain your faith. Don't give up, and don't just fall asleep. 
asleep. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't just fall asleep. And that can happen as we get older. You get tired. You've done this for a long time. And I don't know what we begin to focus on that causes us to lose our joy and our hope sometimes as we get older. But he's saying, don't do that. Don't fall asleep. Don't, don't be found naked. <laughs> you know, it's like, stay awake. And if you stay awake, if you keep going, to continue, to strive for your faith, to work hard to maintain it. To, because, I mean, I think what happens over time is you get done wrong by a lot of people over time. You have a lot of things that you do, and it just comes back on you negatively. A lot of stuff happens, and it just doesn't go the way you plan. It's like you're the Griswolds, and it's just like, what? Keep the faith. And that's what he's saying. Stay awake. You're going to be blessed because I'm coming back. Jesus is coming back. And it's going to be when you least expect it. So I always like it when people are saying, well, you know, he's coming back now. He's coming back. Ah, it's not going to be now because it's going to be when you least expect it. It's going to be like a thief. So be ready. Be awake. And then the next one is in chapter 19. And we'll start reading in verse 6. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we get to this, we'll talk about it a lot more. Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. That's the church. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You, believer, are invited to this table. And if you're invited to this table and you by faith come to this table, it is a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that is blessing because you are being invited to the biggest party ever. And there will be great reward and everything revealed that you now see through a glass darkly. But then you'll see face to face and it'll just be this magnificent, glorious thing of which we're just given a foretaste of his of his body and his spirit today. The incarnation of Jesus Christ as he's gone. As his glorified body is now in heaven and we'll have glorified bodies, but we get a foretaste of that as we come to communion even today, and then in verse chapter 20, beginning in verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those whom the, had the authority was committed. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So this is, we'll talk about a thousand years later, but it seems to be the, the church time. But we're going to be, we're going to be in heaven. We're going to be reigning with him. We're going to be priests. So we're going to be directly um, in God's presence. And the second death, the punishment, the wrath will have no power over us. And that's where blessing is. And then 22.7. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Let's repeat it again. Keeping the words. Follow Christ and remember him. And then 2214, the seventh one. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. And if we had more time, we'd go back and, and look at the book of Genesis. But in the book of Genesis, they were told... They are barred. You cannot get back to the garden unless, what, you eat from the tree of life and live forever. You get to eat from the tree of life. And you enter the city by the gates. Right now, trying to get back in without Christ, there's flaming swords, angels, cherubim, there keeping you out. But Jesus says, I am the door. I am the gate. When you come to Christ, you have access to him, the tree of life. And this is what he says to us and in revelation 7 14 talks about this washing of the robes and it says sir he says the one who are these and he says these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation they have washed their robes and made them white 
in the blood of the Lamb. Through faith in Jesus Christ, what he did for us, us believing in him, that's how you wash your robes. So when you don't stand before God in judgment as the priest with dirty clothes, you stand in front of a holy God with sparkling white raiment, robes, because they're white, and that means no sin, that means you're holy, you're spotless and pure like the lamb because his blood cleaned it. And so if you stand before God or anybody at the gates of heaven and says, why should I let you in? It's like, what do you mean let me in? Look at me. <laughs> I've got the white robes on. But it's him. It's Jesus. That's why you let me in. He died for my sins and I am his and he is mine. And he calls me to himself. And then close with look at Revelation 22, just verses 16 and 17. I, Jesus, so he's speaking, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty Come, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Let's pray. Lord, you have called us to yourself. And you've called all your lands to make a joyful noise unto you. That we're to serve you with gladness. That we are to come into your presence with singing. We're to know that you are God. That you are made us. We did not make ourselves. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. We are to enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We are thankful unto you. We are to bless your name because you are good. Your mercy is everlasting. Your truth endures to all generations. So we do thank you and praise your name. Amen.